When we finally screened the picture in Denver, and we got the cards, a lot of the people said, you know, they couldn't understand. It was unintelligible. They couldn't follow this. You know, they didn't know what the people were saying. It was kind of a different language. Hi. Too much confusion at this point, saying, well, what's this? What's that? What city speak? I don't understand this. What's he saying? And I'm going, oh, God. And, um, and then the previews reflect that. Bud and I insisted that we do, we put some voiceover with, with, um, with Harrison to clarify some of, you know, to, to move the thing forward. And I, and I know this, Ridley, Ridley never agreed to that. I never liked it. And the minute they ended up doing the director's cut, and that was the first, I think, the first thing he, he removed. It wasn't their idea, it was our idea. It was, I am not stupid. I looked at the results and said, this ain't working. Um, I agree with you, but what can we do? How about voiceover? Okay, yeah, let's do it. Hampton had had a voiceover on it, a noir kind of voiceover on it. I did a lot of rewriting on that. They asked me to come to England where Ridley was editing it and stuff and write some more voiceover to solve some problems and stuff, which I did. And then I learned, and I can't remember exactly when I learned, that they'd asked Hampton to do it too because as Michael Dealey said to Hampton, well, David's stuff's wonderful on the page, but when you speak it, it's you know not right or something. And you have to understand, we're, by this time, the story needed help from the voiceover. But of course, that sounds awful when you just start telling the audience what's going on. Now, is far-fetched in or out? She's real three, section one, take one. It didn't help me any. Neither did the flake from the bathtub. Nothing helped, not even booze. I was restless and hungry. I needed the streets and I needed food. Pretty weird. Okay. Pretty weird. The flake. Maybe it was a scale. A fish scale. Real or artificial? Hmm. You need an expert to tell. This is bizarre. God damn, this is bizarre. Um, what? Well, I don't know. I never believed it was gonna be used. And, uh... When I started talking to Ridley about it, it, it turned out that they were, they were things that he uh, was not out of sympathy with. And he's right. He said, ah, this didn't sound right. And I said, no, you're right. So we tried every which way to rewrite, except it was difficult to write. And we couldn't actually land on what he should actually talk about. It's a romanticized view of, of being internalizing What's in his mind? What would he be thinking? Read 11, section one, take four. She told me she loved me too. No, wrong. She told me it was a happy <laughs> It's gonna work great, <laughs> really. This method is perfect. Let's go again. <clears throat> take 11. I figured I wouldn't get the headaches or the shakes anymore. Ah, shit, no, 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 no. Well, yeah, let's go again. 23. I told her about Batty on the roof, dying, making every second count. Sorry. We were, <laughs> I'm breaking my f***ing heart here, and he's laughing. Turned out uh, Ridley and Warner Brothers had some uh, issues with the voiceover narration. And uh, the final versions of the narration were done uh, without uh, Ridley. And, uh, and I missed him. We all went to London to do the cutting, do the post-production. And when we were away, that's when they sneaked in and did the voiceover. I was obliged by, um, by my contract uh, to supply that voiceover narration. And uh, on the last one, I went in to, to do the voiceover narration and I was looking around for somebody. The room was there and the mic was set up, but there was nobody around. So I went to a nearby room and there was a guy in a, in a little gray hobby suit with one of those twist together belts with the little elastic around it. And he had a little pipe, I believe, and he was hammering away at a, uh, at a little portable typewriter. I thought, this must be a writer. So I leaned and I said, hi, I'm Harrison. Uh, how you doing? And I got this. So I went away 
And about 15 minutes later, he appeared, obviously the author of what uh, I was to read. Tandem, Blade Runner, narration, quarter inch roll number three. And I thought, this guy is so far away from the process that I, I mustn't uh, fall into the trap of trying to discuss this with him. Simply do it, do it the best you can, and uh, go home, because I had arduously argued through other versions to try and get the best version we could of the narration, even though I didn't think it was necessary. Testing one, two, three. Gaff had been there. He'd let Rachel live. He had nothing to fear from Bryant, but a lot to fear from me if he'd killed her. I don't like that. Let's start again. Excuse me. Yeah. Didn't you say that bothered you? Uh, no, but I... Oh, I, I thought you said that was getting in your way. No, sir, not... I'm sorry. I heard you wrong. Go ahead, then. There are a lot of people that like it with the voiceover. And as a matter of fact, maybe because they're friends of mine, the majority of the people that I've shown it to like the version with the voiceover better than the, than the, than the director's cut with the, with the voiceover out. I love that voiceover. I want it. I, I, I keep replaying my Criterion Laserdisc to hear that voice. You know, I think that there was an effect that worked for me. There's one area where I thought the voiceover was so clunky, it landed with such a hollow thud. It's the tears and rain. I remember when I first saw the movie, I'm, I'm in the theater and I am so drawn in by what Rutger Hauer is doing and I'm so drawn in by what the theme of the movie has brought us to, this magnificent moment where he is letting go of life. And in those last moments of letting go of life, he's really learned to appreciate life to the point where he spares Deckard's life and where he's even holding this dove because he just wants to have something that's alive in his hands, right? It's an amazing sort of crescendo that's going, and there's Rutger Hauer saying, uh, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. All these moments will be lost in time like tears and rain. Oh my, oh, time to die. And right as I'm just, it's like having sex and somebody dumps cold water on you. Right at that moment where I'm like at my emotional crescendo as a, as a viewer, here comes this thudding, dunderheaded voiceover. I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. Maybe I guess in those last moments he appreciated life more than ever before. I, like, yes, I know that. Thank you. Thank you for kicking this, this, this beautiful, delicate, emotional note that we were achieving right in the nuts. Only after that had been uh, dissected from uh, the film that I got any pleasure out of seeing that movie.